Good morning. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. I'm Bob Plank, and I'm uh, privileged this year to be chairman of Eric's Club. In real life, I'm also chairman. I'm chairman of a company called Independent Marketing Alliance, which is a consortium of large family-owned independent distributors that together do $22 billion in sales. So I'm in the distribution business. Some others of our alumni that are Eric Club members are from Cisco and from the oil industry and from the event industry and all sorts of businesses. I think you'll find there are lots of rich opportunities for you with this degree in a number of areas. Eric's Club is a club for distinguished alumnus and alumni. One of the requirements is to be considered you have to be 20 years from graduation. So hopefully 20 years from now, each of you will experience uh, becoming part of Eric's Club. And our mission is really to support the university in any number of different ways. Uh, this is part of the great tradition started by Dr. Clint Rappole, who's our founder. And where's Clint? There's Clint, okay. Please wave, Clint. Uh, and I'd like to also recognize both our current and our immediate past dean who are here. John, would you, okay, good, John. And Dean, Dean is the Dean, ah, there he is. Dennis is hiding over there. So, uh, to introduce our speaker, it's our last speaker, Jeremy Vladis, who's in the restaurant business, uh, quite an uh, entrepreneur. Jeremy, would you take the stage? Well, first of all, I want to thank the deans and all the people who make this all possible. And I really appreciate you guys allowing me to come back again. So I'm not sure that uh, that happens that often in my world. Um, and I'll say, here I am six months later to either put you uh, all back to sleep or have you laugh at me again. Having such a wonderful uh, crowd in front of me gives me my propensity to talk. But I must keep telling myself, this isn't about me. It's about Jonathan Shear. <clears throat> I was already lucky enough to have this opportunity to share my story. Uh, now it's, uh, I don't know Jonathan very well. So I called up uh, my peeps and talked to a few people and every, everyone had wonderful things to say about Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I know. When Jonathan was 16, he started working in restaurants, catering and hotels he enrolled in Essex Community College in Maryland, and uh, he continued to work in the industry. Like most of us, he knew early on this is uh, what really what he wanted to do. Um, he then continued his studies here at the University of Houston. While he worked, while he was at the school, he worked at the Houston Country Club. He asked the chef if the chef would uh, allow him to get familiar and work in the back of the house. And he did, he worked hard and he learned. After he graduated, he stayed on at the Houston Country Club for about five years as an assistant manager. The next 10 years he spent at the uh, um, uh, Golf Crest Country Club. Thank you very much. <laughs> he knows his background a little bit better than I do. In 1995, he became GM of the Bayou Country Club where he still runs the club 20 years later. That's an impressive thing. His career says a lot about him. Running a private country club means everybody is your boss. And that's no easy gig. Um, Jonathan's got great people skills, and that's allowed him to lead a team and make the members happy for all those years. What you'll really hear is how really good he is with people. And the people skills are probably the most important skills, not just in business, but in life. So, as many have said before, here's John. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Okay. I'm the general manager of the Bow Club. B A Y O U, Bow. That's the Texas pronunciation. If you're from Louisiana, you're going to pronounce that bayou. Because in Louisiana, they have bayous. But here in Texas, we have bows. <laughs> Buffalo bow, braised bow, white oak bow, Sims bow, right? 
We don't talk about the oil business, we talk about the oil business. <laughs> so enough of the diction lesson. I've been there for uh, 21 years and uh, I'm a lucky guy. But you know, we have a lot of alumni of this school that run country clubs all over the United States. I'll mention a couple of them. David Shag, he went to school here, runs the country club in Brookline, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. The country club, that's what it's called. Really? Is that the only country club in the United States? I don't think so. But it was the first country club in the United States. Ryder Cups, multiple times. U.S. Opens, multiple times. Golf, history. You know, in Boston, they're big about telling everybody they were the first, right? Phillips Academy and over the first boarding school in the United States. The People's Republic of Cambridge. Harvard, the first university in the United States. But as I told David one night at the dinner, the way I look at it, if you were the first people here, then what does that really mean? You were the first people to screw Native Americans out of their land. Yeah. We have other people that, are, that graduated here. Kimberly Warren. She's the clubhouse manager at Cherokee Town and Country Club in Atlanta, Georgia. I was just with Kimberly last week in Napa and Sonoma. Bright, intelligent, beautiful lady. Great to hook up with her again. Marvin Jones went to school here. General Manager, San Antonio Country Club. He's been, that's one of the oldest clubs in Texas, I think like 1897. Uh, the Smith uh, boys, Nick, went to school here. He runs Austin Country Club. Wally, he went to school here. He runs Missouri Athletic Club. Um, Austin's dad, Patrick Pettit, Country Clubs at Kingwood. He went to school here. I could go on and on. Uh, Joe Bendy, River Oaks Convention Center. You may know it as the River Oaks Country Club, but it's a convention center. 16 million in food and beverage? Give me a break. Six million dollars in net income? That's not a country club, it's a convention center. Jesus. But anyway, um, you know, so a lot of us transitioned into this club business. Even Charlie Dorn, this guy, he ran the union club for 10 years. And then now he's retired, he's become, an, become a consultant. That's what club managers do. They run clubs, then they retire, become consultants, and make a bazillion, gazillion dollars. Right, Charles? <laughs> so why did all these people uh, choose country clubs? I can't talk for them. I'll just tell you why I work at the Bio Club. Because I work to live. I have a European lifestyle. Work to live. Now, you can go in the hotel and restaurant business if you want to, but if you do that, you're going to do what most Americans do. Live to work. And that represents the dark side of the force. <laughs> do not go to the dark side. Okay? Now, what do I mean by working to live? Well, I'll talk about my gig. I, uh, we don't serve breakfast because it's uncivilized to expect people to come in and serve you breakfast. So we just serve lunch and dinner. So I get to work about 11 o'clock. I never stay past 8 o'clock. Not bad. Hospitality business. Most Saturdays I take off in the hospitality business. Really? Not bad. They pay me real well. Nice. They're, my members are all untouchables. So if you have time and cash, where do you not spend the summer? Houston. So they go wherever they go. Sun Valley, Idaho. Colorado. The Upper Peninsula in Michigan. Maine. I asked one of my members, why do you go to Maine? Because we've been going there for a hundred years. But California is so much nicer. Carmel, Santa Bo But we've been going there for a hundred years. Okay, keep going there. <laughs> Jesus. So, um, I'll talk a little bit about my members. Unbelievable people. 
Now, let me tell you something about this place. 230 people, all related to each other. Oh my God. One big family. Wow. Think about all the crazy stuff that goes on in your families, in my families. Would you ever share that with people on the street? I don't think so. Dysfunction Junction, <laughs> right? But that being said, once you get past all that, and I happen to grow up with a clinical psychologist who taught me how to effectively deal with craziness, so that's cool. Once you get past that, they are some of the most generous, some of the most philanthropic, some of the most just, some of the most moral, and some of the wealthiest people you will ever meet in your life. Let me tell you what they've done for me. So, uh, this is my wife here. This is Marcia. Say hi, Marcia. Hi. And so, uh, you know, when I asked, one of the things when we got married, we've been married for 33 years, and one of the things that I found attractive about her is she's smarter than me. Right? That's important. If you're going to spend the rest of your life with somebody, you don't want to spend them with a dumbass, right? <laughs> so she's smarter than me. Look at her, she's embarrassed. She is. So, you know, we have, you know, go along and kids, right? One kid, then another kid, two boys. And they're both smarter than me. They may be smarter than her, I don't know, but they're smart. So they end up going to this highfalutin Harvard on Westheimer School called the St. John's School. Anybody know anything about this school? It's crazy, man. It's kids that move at warp speed. Average SAT score is 2,200. 2,400 is perfect. That's how bright these kids are. So I got bright kids, so I send them there. But I almost have to file personal bankruptcy just to pay the damn tuition because it's 20 grand per kid. So what happens? One of my members calls me up. Jonathan, I have this uh, education foundation. And uh, I'll tell you what, we're going to pick up your tuition at St. John's. Really? Wow, almost fell off my chair. That's the kind of people I work for, the Bowel Club. Another, another incident of this. They pay 100% of our insurance. They pay 100% of our dependent coverage. Nobody does that, except for the Bowel Club. When are you retiring? <laughs> if I can walk, I can work. So, um, another example of their magnanimous gestures. They, uh, they put a little retirement program for us. And then the law changed so we could establish 401ks. So we're all investing in this and they look at it and they say, Jonathan, you're kind of getting screwed. And I said, yeah because I'm maxing out my contribution and since I'm over 50 I can do what's called a catch-up, right? And I'm contributing at a higher level than the rest of my staff. We gotta fix that. So we're gonna create a safe harbor program to move you out of it so you can keep all your investments. Great. Then a few years go by and they look at the rest of the staff and they say, well they're all investing in it but they're not investing enough. So now we're gonna add a 3% match on top of that to encourage people to invest more. Incredible the bowel club. These people are what I call menches. Do I have anybody here like me who's a member of the tribe? A lawnsman? You don't count. I'm looking for students. Nobody? Really? Wow. We're outnumbered. Okay, well, anyway, the word mensch is a Yiddish word, and it means, well, the prophet Micah once said, it is the duty of every human being to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before thy God. That is the cornerstone of Judaism. That is the cornerstone of Christianity. That is the cornerstone of Islam. It is the cornerstone of every major religion the world has known, if you think about it. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before thy God. That's a mensch. So, 
I guess at this point we're going to talk about, you know, you're probably asking, well, who are all these people that treat people like this? Who are these people? So we're going to go through a little history lesson here. Let me find this pointer. This technology stuff kind of blows me away. So it all started with that guy, William Marsh Rice, and his brother, Frederick Rice. He was younger, which you can tell. They came to Texas in 1844 to find their fame and fortune. Now, Frederick Rice got married, had lots of kids, made a lot of money. William Marsh Rice, his first wife died when she was 25. His second wife ended up in a mental institution. No kids. By 1896, this guy was worth four million dollars. 1896. That is a lot of money, right? And while he was working in Houston, he met that guy. There's the book. Captain James Addison Baker. You probably know that name. The grandfather of James Addison Baker the third, former Secretary of State. You know who I'm talking about? Republican guru the guy who defended the Republican Party with the hanging chads, remember that, before the Supreme Court, and they made George Bush president? That guy. That's his grandfather. And his grandfather started a law firm called Baker Botts right after the Civil War, right? So William Marsh Rice said, I like this guy. He's trustworthy, he's honest, he's hardworking. You ought to read that book. You'll learn a lot about the Baker family in Texas. But um, I'm going to make you executor of my estate. So he did. So William Marsh Rice moves to New York, and he's working, and he comes up with a, uh, he has a butler and a, meets a lawyer, and they're unscrupulous, right? So they decide they're going to murder William Marsh Rice. And they did. They poisoned him. Oh, my God. So they poisoned him. So Captain Baker says, uh, you know, he saw checks coming across his desk, and he says, this is not the signature of William Marsh Rice. I smell a rat. So he takes the train to New York, and he builds a case, and then he goes to the judge, and he said, the butler did it, and the lawyer did it. They did it. So the trial goes on for three years. It's a big deal throughout the United States. They didn't have computers. They didn't have cell phones, but they had newspapers. And $4 million is a lot of money in 1896. So everybody's talking about it. Everybody's watching this trial, right? And they said, uh, okay. The judge goes, the butler did it. The lawyer did it. So off the sing sing they go. And the money reverts back to the 1896 will of William Marsh Rice, which said something like this. If I should die before my time... I will build a great urban university in Houston, Texas of arts and letters. And today that school is known as what? Who said Rice first? Who said it? Who was the first one that said Rice? Somebody said Rice. Who said it? No, you don't count. Who, who, which one of you guys said it? Up here. Okay. So if you're going to be successful in this business, you've got to be two things. You've got to become foodies and you've got to become wine geeks. Right? Because food touches everything we do. Right? In fact, right now, you all should be working in commercial kitchens. Because you need to live food, love food, eat food, know what it's supposed to taste like. If you get a dish where the roux is burned, you need to know what that tastes like. You need to learn it. You're going to be managing food people, and the only way you can manage food people effectively if you, is if you've been there. So you all should be working for kitchens, in commercial kitchens. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to become wine geeks. Why? Because your customers are going to drink wine with the food. Now, that's a problem for you guys because you're young. And to become a wine geek, you've got to drink it. I know you've got this Specs Wine Lab over here and all that crap, but you've got to drink wine. That's how you know what you like. That's how you develop your palate, right? That's going to take time. I've been drinking wine for 30 years. Right? My men's members sent me to France, to Spain, to Chile, to Argentina, to California, 
to the one I'm in the valley just to drink wine. So you said rice first. So you, this is when you become a wine geek. You get to open your wine. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, how does this all relate to the Bow Club? Well, remember I said Frederick Rice's brother had kids? Yep. Kate Rice married this guy. Wow, that's a terrible picture. Baron Hugo Newhouse, the first investment banker in the state of Texas, one of my founders. His claim to fame? In 1928, he told all his clients, get out of the stock market. If there's too much risk, go to cash. Cash is king. Every business has three financial goals. Goal number one, get the cash. Goal number two, get the cash. Goal number three, get the cash. Because if you don't have cash, you can't operate. So they did. And in 1929, what happened? <coughs> Boom! Stock market crashes, and all these guys have boatloads of cash. So what did they do? They bought up the city at two cents on the dollar. Baron Hugo Newhouse, one of my founders. The other founder, Stephen Farish. Farish, Wise, Goddard, Blaffer, Fondren wanted to form an oil company which was an outgrowth of Spindletop. What was Spindletop? What was Spindletop? Oil. What about oil? What it was it? It was a what? No. What was Spindletop? We live in the epicenter of the oil and gas business tree and nobody can tell me what Spindletop was? <laughs> What? Yeah, it gushed. It was a well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Jesus. I'm beginning to wonder about some of you people. Here, when you become a wine geek. So, yeah, that's right. Spindletop was a well in Beaumont, right? But it wasn't just a well. The outflow of the Spindletop well was... Uh, in, was, was so intense that it exceeded the outflow of all of the wells known in the world combined. It was explosive. So, it led to the oil and gas explosion here in Texas. Like, California had the, the uh, California gold rush, we had the oil and gas gold rush here. Spindletop. So these guys wanted to form a company, but the governor of Texas said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to grant you a charter because Fer uh, Ferris was a money guy, Fondren was a driller, Blaffer was a, a geologist, Wise was an accountant. I don't know what Goddard did. I don't care. But anyway, you should know some of those names, right? Blaffer, like the Blaffer Gallery at the University of Houston, that Blaffer. Fondren, like Fondren Road, that Fondren. Well, funny thing happens, you know. Money takes care of money. So that governor was defeated in his election, and Ross Sterling became governor. And Ross Sterling said, I'm going to grant you charter, and I'm going to become a principal shareholder of Standard Oil, of a uh, Humble Oil Company, right? And he was a su successful oil man himself, a driller, separate from them. So they get this charter, and they're drilling oil, and they're hitting oil, and they're having a big time. Then they get together and they say, well, if we're going to make big money, we've got to refine this stuff. But oh my God, we don't have enough capital to build a refinery. What are we going to do? So Ferris, the money guy, says, hold the phone. I know where to get the money. So he takes the train to New York, New Jersey, and he meets with a little old man named Rockefeller. <laughs> Standard Oil Rockefeller, who'd been dying to get into the Texas market, but Texans weren't going to deal with some carpetbagger from New Jersey, right? <coughs> so they come up with this plan. We're going to roll you, fold you into the standard umbrella, and, we'll, and I'll put up the money to build the refinery. Where is the Exxon refinery today? 800,000 barrels a day. Where is it? No, not Pasadena. Where is it? You got it right. You keep, you keep going on. You're going to get it eventually. 
Baytown. Yeah, that's the Exxon refinery, right? So he's, that's another one of my founders, Newhouse and Ferris. And then the third guy, that's a terrible picture. I'm sorry about this, but my son helped me put together this PowerPoint because I don't know anything about PowerPoint. So anyway, but I don't blame him. I took the picture. That's St. John Garwood, the image of him. St. John Garwood was a lawyer, a judge, and an eloquent writer. He did all the legal work. Now, how the club got started is in the 30s, people would die, and they would give land to the University of Texas. That's what everybody did. Well, the people at the University of Texas are educators. They're not land people. They're like, what do we do with all this crap, right? So when these three guys go up to them and say, hey, we want to buy 55 acres on the north side of Memorial Park in Houston, what did the people at the University of Texas say? Take it! So they didn't pay squat for the property. So the club sits on 55 acres uh, on the north end of the park. And they hired this guy. That's John Staub, one of the more famous architects in the city. He designed the Bow Club. He designed Bow Bend, which is I'm a Hogs House, which is now part of the Museum of Fine Arts. He designed almost all the houses in River Oaks. He designed the first River Oaks Country Club when it used to be a country club and not a convention center, clubhouse. He designed uh, the Wise Stables, which still exist. If you go in the back of Stablewood, the Wise Stables are still there. The family has maintained control of that. John Staub, right? So he designed the club, and they invited 67 people to join this club. People like, I'm a hog. Women members always. People like Laura Rice Neff, the sister of Katie and Lottie, who married Stephen Farish. All one big family. People like Estelle Sharp, who was her husband was a spindle top, Marion Neal. People like Jesse Jones, Mr. Houston, Houston Endowment, hired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt to build, design, and get the country recover from the Great Depression? That Jesse Jones. People like J.S. Cullinan, who had a small little fuel company called Texaco. And isn't it weird? J.S. Cullinan's daughter married Blaffer's son. Scary thought. What do you think their kids are worth? Exxon on one side, Texaco on the other side? I don't want to even think about that. Oh my God. People like uh, George Peterkin, whose father started the largest independent barge company in the world. He got that company when he was 25. People like Dylan Anderson, a genius, graduated from Yale when he was 19, married a Carter. W.T. Carter Lumber Company, lumber people from the 1700s. The Carters married a new house. One big happy family. Yeah. Who else were my charter members? Let me see. Oh, and Dylan Anderson, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, you don't know this about me, but uh, my house, I'm a homeless person. I'm homeless. Because on Memorial Day 2015, Bray's Bottle decided to come through my front door at 3.30 in the morning. 20 inches of water in the house. Eight foot Eight foot ceiling, eight foot walls, 20 inches. My cars are floating in the middle of the subdivision, man. Crazy shit. <laughs> My house is destroyed. So I'm living in an apartment, and Dylan Anderson, grandson, Dylan Kyle, is one of my members. He got his granddaddy's smarts because he was number one in his class at the People's Republic of Cambridge, and he's my architect. And he said, I'm going to design your new house. And he did. Six feet up on pier and beam. This house is going to be cool, man. Th Thermidor, cooking equipment, a wine cellar that'll hold a thousand bottles, an elevator going from the top of it. Oh, man, I'm in high life. April 2017, I can't wait. Anyway, enough about my members. Okay, so here we go. So I'm going to show you a little picture show of the club. That's, that's my upstairs, right? There's Baron Newhouse. His portrait's up in the front of my fireplace. So we'll use this. We'll set this up for little lunches and parties. Look how gorgeous it is. John Staub designed 
Look at that molding. That's a stall molding, man. That's cool. Beautiful room, right? That's my upstairs. That's my up porch overlooking my beautiful pool. Yeah, look at that pool. We're going to look at that pool a little bit more. That's my green room, which overlooks the portico as you're coming down the front drive. The clubhouse faces north, I-10, south, Memorial Park. Built in 1938. <clears throat> Why? Pardon me? Oh, man. This one, you're smart. That's right. The sun moves east and west, right? And what didn't they have in... Would you pass that to her, please? And what didn't you have in 1938? Air conditioning. So these porches were all screened, right? Because you prayed like hell. You got a breeze coming off the golf. I don't know how you people functioned in this town without AC, but they did. Ignorance is bliss. What you don't know, you're missing, you don't know. So anyway, that's the only thing that's really changed in the club. The porches have been glass enclosed to support air conditioning. Beautiful. Right? Sisal, rug, all that kind of stuff. That's my English room where my board meetings take place and, my, and we have little lunches. Beautiful room downstairs. That's my grill. Kind of dark. That's where all the members eat. The grill and this down porch. That's where they eat now. Yeah. That's the print that's on my card room. In my card room. Now I'll tell you a story about that. Okay, so when I got to the club, that didn't exist. There was a paisley print on this wall. It looked like some kind of bordello in New Orleans. It was terrible. So John Staub's daughter says to me, hey, we're going to restore this club to the way my daddy wanted it. So we got to have this, this some kind of black geometric print. Well, what happened was when they covered this with that paisley stuff, one of my members was so horrified that he moved that sofa out, he cut a piece out of the wall, he put some plywood in the, in the hole, and he put the sofa back. And so when they were all trying to figure out what does this black geometric print look like, he says, I know what it looks like because I got a piece of it. <laughs> right? So they hired Randy Jones from the Decorative Arts Center to create stencils off that original piece. Bingo. So that, yeah, I know you don't believe somebody would be so eccentric to cut a piece out of the wall, but the top is what he cut out of the wall, and the bottom is the stencils. So that's painted on there. Boom, boom, boom. Pretty wild, all right? What's that? What do you think that is? It's a door. Yeah, right. <laughs> I got that. What else is it? That's my men's room. Can't you tell? Well, if I go into your house, do you put little stupid signs on the door? On your bathroom, do you put men, women, little symbols? Do you do that in your house? No, we don't do it either. That's the men's room. What do you think that is? The ladies' room! Man, who you said that? That's good. <laughs> Did you say that? No, I didn't say that. Who said it? Charlie Ladies' room. It. Oh, no, Charlie. You forget him. He didn't get it. This is students only. That's the ladies' room. Okay? No, we don't put stupid signs on the door. We don't allow any outside business, only members. The only exception for, is for social, charitable nonprofits. So, that's my ladies' room. That's my backyard. Oh, my God. I look at that every day. Drop dead gorgeous. Now, in addition to being a foodie and a wine geek, I'm a tree guy, too. I'm a, I, I plant stuff. Before my house flooded, I used to work on my azaleas in my yard. I plant trees. I planted over 400 trees at the Bow Club since I've been there. Yes, after Hurricane Ike, I planted a bunch of 200 trees. And then I got another 100 trees. I plant trees all over the place. We're all about trees. So this pool is, my, is a second pool. This pool is only two years old. You see there's a diving board on that pool, right? The first pool looks something like this. One by one tiles, the whole pool, right? But it was 20, it was a weird size. It was like 26 yards, 
23 yard. They like started building the pool and they said, okay, that's enough, we'll stop. <laughs> but it had a full meter diving board in a six foot diving well. Uh oh. Anybody here a swimmer? You are? Now tell me what's wrong with a full meter diving board in a six foot well. You're going to hit the bottom. Nobody hit the bottom in 75 years, but we're going to hit the bottom. But the insurance company doesn't want to hear that. They say, take the board down. We're not going to insure you. So what do my members say, right? They're used to telling people what to do. They don't like being told what to do. Okay, we're going to build a new pool. So they got this little program going, and they ask all the members, okay, the members have to vote on this because this little project was $600,000 to build that pool, right? And so they said, uh, okay, well, we got, you know, the bio club, we got $2 million in reserves and no debt. We're in better shape than the United States of America. But <laughs> anyway, they said to them at a shareholders meeting, okay, we're going to just pay cash for it out of the reserves. We're not going to assess you. We just need your approval to build this pool. So it didn't cost them anything, so they said, yeah. 99% of them voted yes. Yeah. So we built this pool. Pennsylvania gray, flagstone, St. Louis antique brick from the city of St. Louis, 250 years old. One by one tiles from France. The whole pool. Wow. And this pool has fountains. It looks like the Bellagio. <laughs> yeah? It's got lights. The old pool didn't have that. So we're up to code and stuff. That's my menu. There's something weird about that. What is it? Who said that first? Back there? Okay. No prices. Yeah. If you have to ask what something costs, you don't belong to the bow club. <laughs> I'm an operator, man. I mean, I, I set my own margins. I got a great job. I don't. Uh, I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a great gig. So I just set the prices according to what my margins are. Um, it's it's kind of strange. I mean, we don't. When I first got there, we didn't have a budget. I said, really? I said, how do you guys function without a budget? He said, well, we take in money, we spend money, we take in more money than we spend, so we don't worry about it. I said, that's ridiculous. We've got to have a budget. They said, no, you can't budget this place. If we want to spend money, we're going to spend money. I said, fine, that's called a variance. You can still have a budget. They said, okay, smart guy, go make a budget. So we've had a budget ever since. But uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. No prices on the menu. Some of my trees I planted, Mexican plums. One of my members grew these things that were this big when she gave them to me, and I planted them. That's how big they are now. That's a little triangle, right? That goes to my croquet lawn, that goes to my tennis courts. In the springtime, this is going to be all white. It's going to look drop dead gorgeous, right? That's a chiso soak. I planted that too. It was a lot smaller when I planted that. That was planted after Ike. That's. Uh, Native to the Chisos mountain range. I don't know why it does well here, but it does. Anyway, it being Ben. Chisos oak. Weeping Montezuma cypress. Planted that too. That's a cool tree. Montezuma cypress, it kind of comes down. Gets big. Nice. Ah. What do you think that is? We are totally isolated. I have no water. I have a well, 1,100 feet deep. I have no sewage. I operate a miniature sewage treatment plant. Now, I don't operate it anymore because when you operate a sewage treatment plant, that's a tricky deal. You got to come out, you got to do testing of samples every day, you got to send it to a lab, they analyze the samples, they send it to the TCEQ, right? So, about 10 years ago, a lab technician inverted a number, sent it to the TCEQ, and the TCEQ went mental. They went nuts. They said, you guys screwed this up. I said, a lab technician made a mistake. You screwed this up. 
How much do you think they fined us for that? $10,000 for a paper mistake. Give me a break. So I called up the TCEQ and I chewed them out. I said, you guys are a joke. They're dumping God knows what in the Houston Ship Channel. You don't do anything to them. And you're going to fine us $10,000 for a stupid paper? Oh, my God. Anyway, so I formed this little shell company called SC Utilities, and I put the permit in their name. So now, if there's any problems with this plan, it's going to go to SC Utilities, not the Bio Club. Yeah? That's my well. That's my well. Oh, 11, all, all our water comes from well water. The city doesn't even know half of what I'm doing. <laughs> they don't. I mean, we built a staff dining room. This is funny. It was a, it's a, I didn't take a picture of that, but that's, there was a hamburger shack. Part of the building was, uh, is an in-house laundry. And then there's a hamburger shack that they used to cook hamburgers for little kids, but that wasn't, that didn't work any well, so it just remained abandoned. So we enclosed this, this hamburger shack and made it my staff dining room. See, we didn't have a staff dining room when I got there, so, you know, we would eat in the clubhouse. So one day we're sitting there eating at about 2 o'clock, and in comes Philip Newhouse. Yeah, I wouldn't be happy family. Newhouse, remember that? Baron Newhouse, his father. So he says, uh, he looks at us sitting around a table, and he just closes the door and he leaves. He said, I'm going to get a call. I got a call. He said, Jonathan, where do the employees eat? I said, Mr. Newhouse, where do you want us to eat? The health department says we can't eat in the kitchen, so where are we supposed to eat? We need to fix that. Okay, so the year passes and I get a new house chairman. Doris Alday Lummis, Madam Iron Butterfly. Soft spoken woman, but you don't want to ever cross this lady. One of my members told me when she was a little kid, she used to tell her parents what to do. <laughs> this, this, this woman's tough. So she's my house chairman, and she said, Jonathan, don't worry about anything. I'm going to take care of this. So we start to build this staff dining room, and of course we didn't pull a permit, right? We're just building a staff dining room, and then one of my construction members said, well, you need to go get a permit. I said, really? We're halfway through construction. You want me to go pull a permit now? He said, yeah. Oh, boy. So I go down to the city of Houston, try to pull a permit. What? You started construction? You can't do that? We haven't approved this permit? I want to know who your members are, who their firstborn were, all this crap. I said, oh, boy, we got a problem now. So I called one of my members, who's an uh, architect. And I said, Mr. Benson, what am I going to do? Benson, like uh, the brother of Lloyd Benson, that Benson. So he says, well, I know the guy down at uh, planning. Let me give him a call. So I'm sitting in my office. And about three minutes later, he calls me back. He says, Jonathan, go down and get your permit. I said, thank you very much, sir. That's how that worked. So anyway, we're going to build the staff dining room, right? And now we have a budget. huh? So it's going to cost $60,000 to build the staff dining room, right? So I'm here. Madam Iron Butterfly is here. And Philip Newhouse is here. German. Frugal. Oh, we can't build the staff dining room. It's not in the budget. Really? And so I'm looking at her and her eyes. I mean, are beginning to really, I could tell she was getting pissed. And he keeps talking why we can't build the staff dining room. And now I'm seeing smoke coming out of her eyes. And I said, when this lady goes off, this is not going to be pleasant. So he finished his little spiel. And she looks at him and she says, Phil, let me tell you something. And I went, mm. she said, all the money we have in this place and we can't give these people a decent place to eat, this is a moral disgrace. What could he do? She just blew him out of the water. Okay, go build a staff dining room. That's how we built the staff dining room. <laughs> there are my tennis courts. I got four clay tennis courts, right? That's my croquet lawn, regulation croquet. We do that there. I got some great croquet players. Just like golf, 
They have what's called bisques. You know, you get a handicap in golf, you get bisques. They go all over the country playing and croak. It's a six-wicket game. Not the little nine-wicket backyard stuff you guys used to do as kids. But this is pretty tough. This is just like a golf green. It's a perfect rectangle, but it's designed like a golf green. So when it rains, two minutes, water's gone. On the back of that, you might see some viewing areas, right? That's because my club in 1938 started as a polo club. In the 30s and 40s, everybody rode horses. Everybody rode horses. Some of the old timers told me, oh, I used to get on my horse and come from River Oaks and tie them up behind the brick wall, get lunch, and then get back on my horse and go home. I mean, everybody rode horses. But when W.S. Farish decided he was going to move to Lexington, Kentucky, it created this, what are we going to do with the stables? By that time, a lot of my members were not playing polo anymore. What do we do? So the Houston Polo Club was kicking off. And they, actually, they're older than my club. They started in 1927 off of where the Galleria is now. That's, there were polo fields. Hard to believe, but there were. So they were looking for a new home. So we formed this uh, relationship with them. And the Houston Polo Club now operates that polo field. Now, that's an interesting deal. You have a polo field smack in the middle of a major metropolitan area. You can't replicate that anywhere in the United States. I mean, that's right in the middle of the city. The only place I know you can replicate that is Buenos Aires, Argentina. And the great polo players today are Argentinian, right? So that's, uh, so the, uh, the Houston Polo Club takes half of it, and the Memorial Park hunters and jumpers, like jumping horses, they take the other half of it. We got two tenants out there, right? We, can, we control the clubhouse, the croquet court, the tennis courts, and the, uh, the pool. Thank you. Senior moment there. Oh, that's it. Okay, so I don't have any more pictures. So anyway, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, this thing is neat. I like this. Go back to the beginning. Okay, there we go. All right. So anyway, I work for special people. I really do. Um, I'll give you an example. Another example. When my house flooded, my club president, Mr. Lama, said to me, Mr. Jonathan, we've got to help you. I said, really? You're going to help me? Well, how do you want to do that? I don't know, but we've got to help you. Your house is destroyed. Okay. How do you suggest we help you? I said, ah, uh, send me money? <laughs> He said, okay, how are we going to do that? I said, just tell the members to send checks to the club. We'll see what happens. So he writes this letter. Jonathan's house flooded. 20 inches of water in the house. Both cars gone. He's homeless. We've got to help him. So please help me help Jonathan. That's how he closed the letter. You know how much money I got out of that? $210,000. That's the kind of people I work for. You all want my job when I retire. I'm telling you. <laughs> they are mensches, man. That's unbelievable that they would do that. That's going to give me a, a good lick on building this new house. This new house is going to cost me $600,000. Yeah. The Bow Club. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> I don't know. What do you want? What else do you want to know? You have any questions? Anybody? You got the flavor of this thing? I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing what I was trained to do. I serve food. They don't sign tickets. They come in. They order food. They don't sign anything. They get up. They leave. I send them a bill. That's how it works. Very civilized. Very civilized. Civilized hospitality. Right? Not the dark side of the force. No. Civilized hospitality. There it is. Yes, sir. How do you manage the people that manage you in this bio club? How do I manage them? Yes. Oh, I don't really manage them. They're my bosses. But when they get kooky and crazy, I just listen. And then when they're done, then we talk about 
reasonable things. And they're, <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're reasonable. I mean, they're, you know, once you get past the crazy family stuff, right? Guess who else was a rice? Howard Hughes Sr. Howard Hughes Sr. invented the rotary drill bit. Built Hughes tools. This isn't the crazy one that you're thinking of. This is his father. Okay? So, when the crazy one... you all, Did you see the movie The Navigator, anybody? Yeah, you know the story, right? He... Sold Pan Am for a windfall, and the government said, oh, man, you're a bad guy. You made too much money. Get up here to the Senate. We're going to rake you over the coals. So he cashed out on Hughes Tools, $400 million, because he needed to build a defense, and he didn't know what the government was going to do. But, of course, he underestimated himself, because he was a hell of a lot smarter than the government. They were idiots. He made them look like idiots. And so they never did anything to him. So what did he do with $400 million? Bought Las Vegas. Yes. Bought Las Vegas. The richest man in the world. So when he died, he didn't have any kids. Where did the money go? To his sister. Who married Dr. Lummis. Remember the Lummis name? Mr. Lummis? My president? David? That Lummis. Howard Hughes. Wow. Pretty amazing, huh? So anyway, uh, I think you ought to look at, at country clubs as a career. I think it's, I've had a great life. I mean, I, I get to see my wife regularly. We drink wine all the time, eat great food. She's a great cook, I'm a great cook. We have a good gig going. Kids don't live with us anymore, thank God. <laughs> My older one is an energy analyst for Blackstone Minerals. My youngest one, my little genius math kid, <coughs> scores a perfect 800 on the SAT. Give me a break. I never knew anybody that scored a perfect 800 on the SAT. And I got one living in my house? What? He's a petroleum engineer. He works for H.J. Grewey Consulting. He had a good gig, too. He was living in the Rice Hotel, walking to work. Wow. But now his company's moved to Bel Air to save $200,000 a year on rent. So he's got to drive. Oh, poor baby. He's driving against traffic. When he comes home, though, it's a mess. He's going to have to move, but that's his problem, right? So all these people are related to the Rices. That's, 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 that's the bottom line. So I work for one big happy family. It's great. They're crazy. That's fine. That's just like everything else in life, crazy. So you ought to consider clubs as a profession. I, I really, it, it's, it's a wonderful life. And that's it. That's all I have. Right oh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Scher, um, whenever you were working in kitchens and you decided to go out of that, how did you find this position? Because it's so, this club is so exclusive and you don't hear anything about it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, how did I get this? <laughs> um, okay, so I started off working in kitchens at Houston Country Club. I cooked, that's where I learned about food. Okay? And then when I graduated, the manager there, Bob Southwell, said, you want to go into club management? I said, well, okay. I mean, it seems like a nice place, I'll do it. So he hired me as an assistant. I was there for five years. And then I said, well, I can do this myself. I don't need you telling me what to do. So I went down to Golf Cross Country Club and I ran that for 10 years. Then by that time, the manager, my manager, Bob Southall, had retired and he became a headhunter for club managers, right? So he calls me up and he says, how would you like to work at the Bow Club? I didn't even know what it was. But I'd heard members of Houston talk about it because 60% of my members belong to Houston Country Club and the other 40% belong to River Oaks. I said, well, send me the financial statement and I'll let you know, right? So he sends me the financial statement. They got $2 million in investments and no debt. Oh my God. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something right. Let me come talk to them. So I went out there to talk to them. And I, I walk into the interview and it's like, I start laughing at myself because five of them I already knew. 
because they were members of Houston, right? So they asked me a bunch of questions, and I said, okay, that's fine. They said, go away. We'll call you back. So they call me up, and they say, okay, come on out. Bring my wife. Come out. We want to meet your wife. Okay. So Marsh and I go out there, and they put us in this little room, and the board members take my wife, and they put her in a corner, and they start asking a bunch of questions. And their wives put me in a corner, and they start asking me a bunch of questions. Then they switched it. <laughs> then they said, okay, go away. We'll let you know. So I walk into the car, and I said, oh, my God. Marsha. I said, you know what they just did? She said, no. I said, they interviewed you for my job. <laughs> so then... Uh, the president at the time says, we want to see what kind of job you do, so we want to come down to Golf Crest. I was still there. So they come down to Golf Crest. I set them up with a round of golf, fed them lunch, and then they start interviewing my employees there about me. I said, boy, these guys are serious. This is a serious gig. Well, the guy before me did some stuff that was inappropriate, and they didn't want to get burned again. So then George Peterkin calls me up. I think it was October 15th, he's the president, Mr. Kirby International. And he says, Jonathan, we want to hire you to be the next manager of the ball club. I said, okay, when do you want me to start? He said, uh, December 1, and my heart sunk. And I said to him, Mr. Peter, can you ask me to leave a club that does 40% of its business in three weeks in December? I can't do that to them, that's not the right thing. And I always try to do the right thing. He says, well, I'll tell you what. So we've been waiting to hire a professional club manager for 75 years. I think I can wait another two months. I'll see you January 2nd. And when he said that, I said, I'm working for people that know how to make proper decisions and treat people properly. And it, it's a great place. It's a great In fact, June of 2016, I have hired one of you guys who will become the first assistant manager in the history of the ball club in the 75-year history. You know who she is? That person right there, Denise. Yeah. And the guy sitting next to her is Austin Pettit. His dad runs the country clubs at Kingwood. He's going to do an internship with me in the spring. I always hire University of Houston students. One of my interns is working at River Oaks as an assistant catering director. Another one of my interns is working at Houston Country Club in the catering office. So I, hi I look out for people that looked out for me, this school. I hire my, my own. And there are several managers out there dotted throughout the country that also look for University of Houston students. We have something called the Club Managers Alliance, right? Myself and David Shag and Joe Bendy put together this scholarship endowment, right? Well, it's worth something like $500,000 now. We give scholarships to kids who show interest in club management. Big scholarships, like I think the last one we gave. How, how much? Help me. What do we give? Miguel, Sorry. how much money did we give out the last time? $15,000 worth of scholarships. Five grand to one kid, four grand. To, we, we're, we're serious. We're serious. And the purpose of this Club Managers Alliance is to network clubs from all over the country so we can get them together and get on this hire Hilton thing and hire you guys. Because that's what we're trying to do. Right? Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Let me, let me say one other thing. I need to give a shout out to the student, the CMA student chapter here. There's a CMAA student chapter, Club Managers Association of America, which we are all members of. They do great things, and if you're not involved in that, that's a good organization to get involved in. Go do it. Wonderful job. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. I got something. Ah, okay. Uh oh. It doesn't tick and it won't explode. 
Oh, wow. That's beautiful. University of Houston, Conrad Hill College, Jonathan Shear, Eric Hilton, Distinguished Chair, Alumni Series, November 5th, 2004. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> wow, they even spelled my name right. <laughs> cool. Hey, and you don't get away without a place to sit at that new employee dining spot you have. Yeah. Has your name oh, on man. It, nice. University of Houston. Oh, man, I'm just chilling out. <laughs> you have a chair for the house? Yeah, I have a chair. And, Wendy, will we, how do we get that clean? Um, I will send it to him. Okay, great. So, once again, thank you very much. Thank you.